Welcome back to Steel and Vance. Linda, you and I love to unpack the uncomfortable or awkward conversations. <laughs> and we're going to have one that is uncomfortable for so many people for all the wrong reasons, talking about preparing for the inevitability of death. Well, and this came up because I was saying to Jody, I don't know why, but it seems like I know so many people right now who are passing away either unexpectedly or, yeah, it was age-related, uh, people who didn't have wills, people who are stunned family members in grief. But I thought, you know, you and I have both, you know, seen our parents, uh, at least one of them out the other side and... The you think you're prepared and you're not. It's better to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have invited, actually you discovered our next guest to come in to talk through how to best prepare yourself for death and taxes. <laughs> it's a thing we all share, right? right? Yeah. Okay, so Amy Wood is an end of life doula in Vancouver. And thank you so much for coming in. Because I'm pretty sure that when you're at a cocktail party and somebody said, oh, what do you do? And you say, I'm an end of life doula, that must be either shut down the conversation or keep it going all night long. What do you tell people? Absolutely. Um, well, I tell them that I'm an end of life doula and some people know what that is and some don't. And I tell them uh, I'm a death doula. And so what that means is that I work with people, individuals when they're dying, when they're near the end of life. And I also support their families and their loved ones. So practically yeah. speaking, can you kind of lay out what that looks like? Because you also would counsel healthy people to prepare for yeah, exactly. end of life as well. But let's talk about the people who call you when they're in crisis and say, I, we don't know. Mm -hmm. what, where does it begin for you? What are the first steps you say to somebody or steps that are taken for you in your process? Yeah. Um, people come to me at different stages and times during all of this. Some do call really in crisis. Um, in overwhelm, in the heat of the moment. Uh, maybe they've been sick for some time, but they just recently discovered that they have a, a prognosis now that they are now in palliative care, that their treatment's no longer working. And so that's a really overwhelming time for a person and for their family. So sometimes it's actually that person who calls me and other times it's, it's a caregiver, it's a family member wanting support for themselves or for the whole family. Um, so usually we, we sit down and we have a conversation slow things down and put on a pot of tea mm. and let's just because yeah. talk through where be you're scary. at it shouldn't yes. be we're yes. all gonna die exactly it shouldn't be scary but it is and i wonder how do you demystify death there's so much about death that we don't know um and i think that's the scariest part we, we don't know about it and so i think it's about really listening to people meeting them where they're at and taking the lead of that dying person um so that they have a safe place, a safe space to ask the questions that they want to ask, um, to share their fears and worries. And let's talk about what are your main concerns right now? What can I do practically to support you through that, to support your spiritual journey, your emotional journey, your emotional well-being, the well-being of this family? Um, what would help to make feel better? What kind of planning can we put in place? Um, really holding space for all of those conversations. Mm. Um, yeah. So, Amy, when it comes to the practicality of preparation, mm -hmm. the will, mm -hmm. the things, the stuff, the complexity of a family unit that might be coming back together, and it's not necessarily, I mean, clearly the situational piece isn't positive, but even the interpersonal bits might be difficult. Mm -hmm. There might be mm -hmm. push and pull. Um, how, how, do, how does somebody like yourself decide, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's what I want. I want to be a par part of that. It takes a special person, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, what brought you to what this? What brought me to this? Yeah. I've always been interested in, in death and dying, even as a young child. Really? Um, I'm an empath, so I felt comfortable with people when they're, when they're real, when we're having honest and earnest conversations, you know, um, when they're raw. That I always felt most comfortable there. And I, I came to learn as a child that that's maybe not that common, mm. <laughs> that most people don't want to do those things, would rather have the small talk. And I'm actually more comfortable there. So I always knew I wanted to work with people in a one-on-one -on -one way in some kind of helping profession. So. Because you also do hospice work, which kind of yeah. led you to this exactly. new career, and you still continue to do it, which I think mm -hmm. hospice oh workers gosh. are special mm -hmm. angels, so thank you for mm -hmm. doing that. Um, can you, without revealing confidences from someone you have worked with, tell us a little bit of a story about what mm -hmm. it's like to be that intimate 
with people you don't know you're just developing relationships with? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting because it, it's such an honor and to think that I'm a stranger to somebody in, in a hospice room when I walk into their room um, to find out whether they're open to having a visit, a conversation. When I work with a family as an end-of-life doula, I'm coming in uh, in a very difficult time of life, a stressful time, and they welcome me in and allow me to be there for these really incredible moments. So many things I've witnessed, um, so many tender moments near the end of life, and things like that people what? Without share. Without again revealing um, a confidence, just take us there for a moment. Um, I think about a man who wrote uh, a beautiful song for his wife and played that for her in her final days that he he wrote those lyrics and the words for her and that's something he hadn't done before and he mm. put that together so that was a really moving time um, I think about another woman who in her advanced planning you know some of the things we can do when you have the opportunity to think about ahead about how you might want that time to look who you want to be there uh, what sounds and sights and smells you want in the room and this woman had the lovely idea she loved flowers and she had the idea of having a bowl at the front of the door before people would come in in her last week of life or so of flower petals and every time they come in they would take a handful and place them on her bed and spend some time and say things they wanted to say to her beautiful. and so when she died she was surrounded by beautiful flowers and the people oh, that she loved so that just now, gave me goosebumps. that's a gooder yeah. yeah it is yeah. so when you're talking about the preparation piece a friend of mine works in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And she says, our hospitals are absolutely filled with people who had no plan, with family or none, no family around or no support system around other than the staff that might be in the hospital who don't know their wishes. Exactly. And they're put in this position. So how do you speak to healthy individuals mm -hmm. about preparing themselves for those ideas in the final days beyond the clinical nature of a do not resuscitate order or mm -hmm. what have you like mm -hmm. what what kind of a, a advice would you give our viewer in terms of if somebody's going I have nothing I don't even have a will what, what where do I start yeah well to be honest I'd normalize that and say that most people don't I think it's less than a quarter of Canadians that have a will in place and a will is really just the starting point yeah. of the end of life planning so um, I'd encourage you to to be brave to be courageous and just sit down with somebody. Give a, give one of us a call. Talk to your family and friends. That's the most important thing. But there's there's a lot of aspects to that planning. There's the financial planning and the legal will. There's a medical aspect. And I think something that people often don't think about is it's not only planning for the our eventual death and what might happen before and leading up to that, what choices we would want to make and following our death, but also in the case that we are incapable of speaking for ourselves. Right. This happens in the hospital a lot. Mm -hmm. So to have some documentation in place that I can help you with for who's going to make those choices for you. You know, in the process yeah. of uh, doing a little research for this segment, I came across a game. I mm -hmm. actually tried to order it and then something happened. I'll, I'll still get it. It's a death game, a card game. Yeah to open up the conversation with wow. people. It sounds gruesome. We need uh -huh. to get that. But there's some great questions no. in right. there that over a glass of wine, you'd be like, oh, so that's what my husband really wants. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's called you played the, that? Yes, it's called the death deck. There's yes. a couple of them, actually, yeah. And it's great because that's you can just cool. pull that out in a social setting. Yeah. I think this is what it's about. I'm so grateful that you had me on here today to talk about this, to kind of normalize dying. Um, death and dying is a really natural part of life, all things that live die. Um, really kind of demystifying death in general and bringing it, it back to being the social event that it is. And I, not taboo, yeah, right? People exactly. fear, I've, yeah. in conversations as interviewers, as broadcasters, as people who try and pull out the story from people, and if you ask somebody, you know, what are your thoughts on this? They're like, well, I don't like to talk about mm -hmm. it. It's almost like if I speak of it, it will happen to me, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm that yeah. taboo and obviously that's not true right no. yeah is there one lesson that you have learned as a human being from having the privilege of helping other people exit that you would like to share uh, I'd have to say it comes down to the kind of cheesy or cliche it's all about love when in the last moments in the last times of life people this is what I've noticed they they come have I loved enough mm. have I been loved enough have I made an impact um, I think that when we
bring the awareness back to our impermanence, you know, it gives us the opportunity to realize what a gift and privilege it is to be alive mm -hmm. so that I can go forth and live more fully in the time that I have left. Less about things and yeah. stuff and, I and think power. And you're not exactly. saying how arguments. many times did I, you know, how much it's, money did I make? No, exactly. it's not that. It's yes. not even about the regrets. Typically, yeah. it's, it's really about the last thing people want to say is I love you mm -hmm. to the people they loved. Oh, wow, we have to end there. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank oh, you good. so much for coming in. Well, thanks for having me. It's really oh, honored you got to be me. here. <laughs> this is a really important conversation. It is. Are you tearing up again? Sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. I'm Sorry. also thank a bit of an empath, much. so thank <laughs> you, Amy. Amy Wood, uh, End of Life Doula. You are, your website is Vancouver End Vancouver of Life? Vancouver End of Life Doula .ca. All right. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Whew. Let's lighten up and talk about art next. I need to... Take it, take it, take, I love a, that, take a sip. Uh, okay. Because when we Thank come you. back, we're going to talk about the Save the Spidey campaign. This is an eight foot arachnid that is opening up a debate about public art in Vancouver. Scary. Oh, stay tuned for that.